it is good to be here this evening. Hope you're glad to be here tonight. As I think about tonight and our study, one of the things that comes to mind is this. You keep using that word. Somebody knows where I'm going. (laughs) I don't think it means what you think it means. Tonight, we could say, you keep using that verse. I'm not sure, to be a bit nicer at least than the movie, I'm not sure it means what you think it means. Within the Bible, there are a number of quotes, a number of of things that are referenced even. Perhaps I should back up and reword that, all right? It is possible to quote or reference a number of things from within the Bible. And we hear them fairly often in our world, not just even among those that might claim to be Christians even. And somebody will say, they'll, they'll reference or even quote something from the Bible, and then, I'd better push the button, and then they'll say, well, that's in the Bible, or something like that. They might say it even as a question. Did you know that's in the Bible? Did you know it's in there? Especially when it might be something that sounds a bit strange or bold, and they might get some quizzical looks or some mean looks, and then they'll, they'll qualify and say, or follow up even, well, that, that's in the Bible. It's in there. And they're right. I mean, sometimes they're not right, though, right? Like, you know, godliness is, is the same as cleanly, however that goes. See, I don't even know how the quote goes. There are some things that are, have been attributed to the Bible or at least people think are in the Bible because it's said so religiously that aren't actually in there. But quite, quite often, there are things that are said that are in the Bible. They might even find their way into a sermon or a class, but they might not be using that verse or that reference properly. Now, tonight, and if we always talk about things in sermons and classes that we're worth fighting over, that that would be an interesting world. There are, there are some matters that are essential, and some passages that you use them in a certain way, and they are very dangerous. But for our study tonight, let's look at some passages of all things from the minor prophet Amos. When was the last time you studied or heard a sermon on or from Amos? In my experience, if, if my limited experience is correct, might not have been, or might have been quite some time ago. You might not have heard a lot about Amos. You could open up already if you want to the verse 1 of Amos, very beginning of Amos. As you look at some examples tonight of some passages, as you read through Amos, as I've read through it at least, it strikes me there are at least four or five helpful examples of times when we might take a verse and apply it in a way that is very distant from the original context, from the original meaning or even application. Hopefully, by considering these examples, it will make us better Bible students, better people of the book. Amos begins by saying that this is something that he saw. You'll likely have the word saw or something similar in the very beginning of Amos. Amos chapter 1, verse 1. That is, when you read that, especially at the beginning of a biblical document, or even through later in the document. The book of Revelation is a good example, where John sees various things. It is a cue to the reader that at least a good amount of the content of what's to follow is visual in form. We could use the word from this morning's study and say that that these are visions of sorts. There are times in the Bible... There are some other minor prophets where it starts by saying the vision of and will give you the prophet and then you get the vision. Even though it's written down for us, it's not a picture book, but it's something that Amos sees. And then he writes down based on what he sees. Part of why that might be important for our time even tonight is that 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 tells me also that some of the things in this book, there's a good, I can make a good bet, if we wanted to make a bet, I'm not telling you to go make a bet, but it's, it's likely that this book has a lot of things that aren't, aren't meant to just be where you read it and then you go directly from there to here's what it means in your life. There might be some other things that need to happen first. Without further ado, 
Here's example number one. Let's turn to Amos chapter 3 now and verse 3. Amos 3, verse 3. Of these examples tonight, I would place out there, put it out there, I'll go out on a limb tonight. I think this one's in competition with the second one we're going to look at in a moment, Lord willing, with being the most popular. I think this one might be the most popular in the sense of it being quoted by people or finding its way into something, a public speaking situation. The second one has its own reason for its popularity. We'll get there in a moment. Amos 3, verse 3. It's a question. This is one, I need to add this before I read it, go ahead and remind you or fill you in that this is one, if you look at a parallel, like on biblehub.com, you get different, verse, different versions. This one is translated a few different ways from the Hebrew, as normally I'm using the English standard tonight. Here's what it says in the ESV. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet. Now, the ESV does, does give us a bit more insight and a few other English versions, but there are some versions that make it even easier to walk away from Amos 3 with this conclusion, that Amos 3.3 3 is about doctrinal agreement. And the, and the idea is that if, you, if we don't agree on something in the Bible... Well, we, we can't have fellowship, we, we can't be together, we can't work together, we can't do things together, we can't walk together. And so the verse is about unity, the unity of God's people. We, we must agree on the Bible or, or else we can't do anything together, or at least we shouldn't. Pause for a moment. There is some truth to that idea. Now, there's some danger to it as well, in that if you force this in this application, then you have to agree on everything, or you can't be in fellowship. And that is where we start drawing circles, our little circle of, well, here's what I believe, and here's what I think this means, and that, and here's how, and our circle just keeps getting smaller and smaller, and I think I've said this before, before you know it, the circle's over there. <laughs> And you don't fit in the, your own circle anymore. Ever seen that happen? But here might be, here might be the other issue. Because, yeah, we need unity. And we have to agree on those matters we talked about a minute ago that are worth fighting. I don't mean fisticuffs. I mean they're worth going to verbal battle over. They're worth standing your ground. And if we don't agree on those essential matters, like just start with Ephesians 4, the seven ones, then, yeah, we're not really going to be able to be in, in fellowship. But read the rest of the text. Let's go through verse 8. When you start reading the rest of the chapter, this is in a string of different inspired illustrations. Preachers and teachers today, we use illustrations. The biblical writers do as well. The Holy Spirit does. Verse 4. Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion cry out from his den if he has taken Nothing. And that cry seems to be one of either victory or pleasure, the pleasure of eating his catch. Verse 5, does a bird fall in a snare on the earth when there is no trap for it? Do you, do you get what he's illustrating? All of these are different examples of where you see something and a little common sense, just a smidge of deductive logic, leads you to B from A. But this doesn't happen without that. Could it be then that all Amos 3.3 is about is the illustration that if two people start walking on the road together, how are they going to show up at the same time and all that? Unless you, know, it, you could throw in some big coincidence. Unless they plan to do so. Unless they've agreed, how, how does that work? They don't just randomly start walking together. Just like these other things aren't random. Verse 6, it is a, is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid. Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? It's so actually the first time you get some more of what we would, we would think of as spiritual aspects. But still, verse 6 is really just an illustration. It's not his point. You have to keep reading. For the Lord does nothing, verse 7, without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. 
If you wanted to, to write down the point of all of these verses, I think it's verse 7. And I'm not, I'm not going to go out in the parking lot and fight you. I'm not going to fight you at all. But I think that's the point. That God's not going to throw you a surprise. Not like this, at least. In this case, God is not going to, to punish you or do anything like that without warning you, and giving you a chance to repent. He's not going to expect you to do something and know something in some secretive way. He doesn't keep those secrets to himself. He reveals them to you through his prophets. Look at the next verse. Verse 8, the lion has roared, who will not fear? It's a similar type of illustration. The Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? That bookends this whole string from verses 3 through 8. Now, if you wanted to take away an application bit from this verse, we're not studying all of Amos 3, that's not our point tonight, but if you wanted to jot that down or, or make thought, give some thought to it, you could think about it this way. You could think about it for us. And then God, God has given us his complete written revelation. There are no surprises. Yeah, along the lines of some things we talked about a week ago, there's some things we don't know all the details, and there, there might be some surprises when it comes to some of those details as to exactly how everything's going to look and be, partly because of our limitations mentally and emotionally. But for the big things and what really matters as far as what we need to do and how we need to respond, like the gospel preparing for when he comes, he hasn't kept us in the dark unless we don't turn on the light. That's, that seems to be the point. It's God's not going to spring something on you and then, oh, well, I, I didn't know. He's going to give you warning, in this case even, of his judgment that's coming. That's Amos 3, verse 3. The two walk together unless they've agreed to meet. Let's look at chapter 4 now. Chapter over, verse 12. I mentioned this one having its own special reason for popularity. We have a song in our song books. Now, I better stop right there. Before you go out shaking your head and thinking, Gant's telling us to rip out something from the song book. Okay, even if I told you to, that doesn't mean you, sh you would. I I'm not trying to, I'm not at all putting down the song. In fact, I, I like the song a lot. It's one of my favorite invitation songs. I don't mean just in, it appeals to me personally. I mean, I think it's a really stirring question stirring idea but if the song is, is based on the verse I don't know that it should be based on the verse the song is good by itself in other words here it is Amos 4 verse 12 I better hurry up or some of you are already going to be reading the verses around it and cheating some of you were caught you alright Amos 4 verse 12 therefore thus I will do to you O Israel because I will do this to you Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Now, the way that it is sometimes, I like the word sometimes because it leaves me a little opening there, employed, this verse, and especially that last statement, prepare right, to meet your God. I and mean, if you read the first part of even the verse, it gives you a bit more of a hint into the meaning. But that phrase, prepare to meet your God, is that, we need to make some changes. We need to repent. In, in, the, in our case for today, it would be, if we haven't become a Christian, we need to do that. We need to be in the body of Jesus. And then as a Christian, we need to be living faithful and all of that. Because we've got to get ready. We've got to prepare to meet God in judgment. That part is right. How do you do that? How do you really prepare to meet God? I, I plan to, to meet God someday face to face. But what does he mean when he says prepare to meet your God? Let's back up to verse 11. Verse 12 is especially, or certainly, when you look at it in its context, it is itself a chilling verse. But 11, and I, I would say more so 13, we're about to read. I think it would be difficult to find a more, to borrow from another genre, a more spine-tingling or soul-chilling verse 
then 13, perhaps coupled with 12. Look at 11. I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as a brand plucked out of the burning, yet you did not return to me. I gave you a chance, he says, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, because judgment is coming, because I'm going to punish you in a greater way than the small way. I already gave you a taste of it. Get ready. More's coming. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. And then 13, for behold, he who forms the mountains, creates the wind, who declares to man what his thought is, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights or the high places of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. You see, when you read it in context, it is not change and repent. As much as it is, you've passed the point quoted a movie, now we can quote a song, The Point of No Return. You've gone too far. I gave you chance after chance to repent. I even gave you some discipline. So now, prepare to meet me in my divine justice. My judgment is coming. And it is a rhetorical, in a sense, command because you can't do that. You can't. Now, I can prepare in the other way. I can make changes and prepare. But that's not, is that really what Amos is saying here? Now, if you wanted a takeaway here, we'll do the same thing we did with Amos 3. Amos 3. It could be. One, to realize and rejoice in the fact that as long as right now, I haven't been given, we haven't been given this specific writing or message. We didn't receive a letter in the mail at Second and Adams or even the church global saying, it's too late. My judgments, the Babylonians and the Assyrians, Assyrians more accurately here, are on their way already. The siege, the siege engines are made and rolling out. We haven't received a message like that. For us, it is. There's always hope for change. As long as you have breath in your lungs and your mental faculties, you can change. Until you die, or if you were to come before I die, because that's then when I die, or if he shows up tonight in the ultimate form of verse 12, that's when Amos 4.12 really applies. Then it's prepare to meet God in his judgment on you. So take that, make sure we are ready in the other way before it's too late. That's Amos 4, verse 12. We're in Amos 3, Amos 4. How about we keep going? Let's look at Amos chapter 5, the very next chapter, three in a row. Toward the end of the chapter now, we're going to read verse 21 and 22 together. Amos 5, 21 and 22. There are a number of passages that are similar to this. There's a pretty lengthy one in the beginning of Isaiah. Here's Amos. Amos 5, 21 and 22. I hate, and this is in quotes from Yahweh, from the Lord. I hate, he says, I despise. I mean, he could have just said one or the other. I hate, I despise your feast, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And peace offerings of your fatted animals, I will not even, he says, I will not look upon them. Here's how I have heard this view. That what God is doing here is God is condemning their sacrifices and their keeping of the holy days, the holidays, because that wasn't what he wanted ever. And I don't know, if you follow the logic, I don't know if it's that Moses just got mixed up or he just thought it up and said this is what God's told you to do and Joshua just went along. I don't know how that exactly works out. 
And here's where it does become a bit more serious. That sometimes this is also then used to teach the idea that God doesn't really want you to bring anything or to do anything. He doesn't, really, he doesn't want any of that. Don't make any sacrifices today in the sense of worship or service to God because that's, that's being legalistic to say that God wants you to do things in obedience. Is that what it's saying? You could read it that way, right? Where God says, I don't want that. I don't know why I wrote it in my law. I don't want it. And then you could look at the next verse, verse 23. And this one's been used in a different way. Stay with me, please. Look at verse 23. Take away from me the noise of your songs. That one sounds a bit odd. And then he says, to the melody of your harps, I will not listen. This one has been taken and applied this way. Here God's saying, even though, yeah, there, there were times in the Old Covenant when they had mechanical, to use that more maybe precise language, instruments of music and worship to God, but God doesn't really want that. And that's why we don't do that in the New Covenant, because Amos 5, 23 says God isn't going to listen to that. He doesn't accept that. Do you know why I told you to bear with me? I am not suggesting that the conclusion is wrong. But I don't know that Amos 5.23 is the way to go about it. I firmly am convicted in my mind that God doesn't want us today, regardless of any of the details. And it, it, there's a whole discussion about how they even did it that sometimes isn't understood. And that's another sermon. But I, I'm firmly convinced because of certain teachings in the New Testament scriptures that God doesn't want us. He wants us to sing with our hearts, two instruments, voice and hearts. But this is, it's like a yellow teeth argument. You ever heard of a yellow teeth argument? It's the argument that you shouldn't smoke because it turns your teeth yellow. Do you think that's why you shouldn't smoke? I don't think, I mean, it might not, you might not enjoy it, all right? But you might want to pull up a, a bit more information from the medical professionals as to the dangers of, of smoking. And tonight's not a sermon telling you, you know, don't, don't smoke. But that, that's kind of like this. The, the conclusion might be pretty, pretty valid. I might agree with some or all of the conclusion. But how you got there, I don't see that. But it gets better. Look at verse 5 of chapter 6. Just read the verse who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David invent for themselves instruments of music. Amos 6, verse 5. Forget the fact that it's, we're even coming in the, very, the middle of a sentence, verse before it and after it even finished, began and finished the sentence. Even when David did it? And I guess we have to say, even when it's a part of inspired scriptures like the Psalms, that was just David's opinion. David just made that up. He invented it. It's an innovation of David. Now, that may be. But I don't know that Amos 6.5 is the place to have that discussion. Especially since it is possible to translate it with a more sarcastic tone. That they think they are like David in inventing or in, in their musical talent. But back up. Let's go back now to verse 24, Amos 5. Here, here's the point Amos is making. The point Amos is making is not really to, about the discussion of should you have instruments in worship or not. He says, but, Amos 5, 24, let justice roll down like waters. Thankfully, this is also a pretty quotable quote. I've seen it on social media quite a bit recently. And let righteousness, like an ever-flowing stream. And then 25 through the end of the chapter, he brings in their idolatrous practices. Even back in the wilderness, they had their problems. The problem is not that God didn't command or did not want their sacrifices or their holy days. The problem was that they spent, let's make it more modern, they spent Monday through Saturday mistreating their fellow humanity, lying and cheating and 
all of that. And then they showed up on Sunday morning or a Sunday night. And now, now I'm going to worship God because that's what a good Christian does or a good mosaic law keeper for that context. The point is don't bring me your worship. Don't bring me your sacrifices. Don't bring me, don't honor my special days. Don't pretend to be following me in religious on Saturday or be it Sunday. But your life doesn't reflect the same. It's like if you only diet one day a week, or you only, I'm going to move quickly because I don't want to pick on people, or you only run, I'm not a runner, so I'm picking on myself here, I guess, if you only run one day a week, how do you think that's going to go? God's saying, I want you to run throughout your week. So when you get to, my, to worship me, one, it's acceptable, two, you actually are doing it with your heart. You can do it. It's going to be pretty difficult to even worship right if you only run one day a week. And then look at chapter 6 a little closer. I have 1 through 6, but let's notice a couple of examples. Chapter 6, verse 1 is, Woe to those who are at ease at Zion. Verse 4, right before verse 5, Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. Then you get verse 5, and think of how the word idol fits in there here now. Verse 6, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but, here's the point. The point is not even about don't have a luxury car and don't have a recliner and don't have a microwave. That's not really the point. But, are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph over the sin of the people and of the judgment that's coming. And they're just sitting back, taking it easy. It's like Nero playing his fiddle while Rome burns, or you sit back and watch the world burn. You just don't care. That's the point of Amos 6, verse 5. Now, we can have a discussion about the rest of what verse 5 says, but it'd be really tough to make the point or the conclusion from Amos 6 verse 5. I think you can already see the, what I suggest tonight is the more legitimate application of Amos, the end of Amos 5 and 6, relating to authentic worship from the heart and life and the danger of complacency in our own comforts and conveniences. So this is a, a twofer. We've got one more now. Let's go to Amos chapter 8. We're going to break our pattern and skip a couple of chapters. Amos chapter 8. And let's read together verse 11. Amos 8 verse 11. I remember many years ago, so long I don't even remember at all the speaker. He was, wasn't even a speaker within the church. And I, so I don't even remember his name. Not that I would tell you his name anyway. That's not what we're about. But I remember the whole, it was a radio sermon. The whole radio sermon was about the famine of the Word of God. And, I'll, and it, sounds, it sounds really good. And I, this is one of those, totally agree with the, what, where you go with it. Because it's, people don't want the Word of God. There's a famine in our land. People aren't desiring his word, so they're, they're empty. They're filling themselves up on junk food, things, messages and sources and information that aren't going to satisfy and aren't going to lead them in healthy, godly ways. Amen. Let's read it. Amos 8, verse 11. Behold, the days are coming. Another ominous beginning. Declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Now, if you stop there, you'd think it's a, an actual famine. But here, here's the vision. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water. It's not that kind of famine. But of hearing the words of the Lord. You, 
It could sound that way. Or it could also sound like ignorance. The people aren't going to know God's word because they're not desiring it. See how that works? From 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Now, the ignorance one does have a bit more accuracy within this context. But read verse 12, very next verse, just two verses here for context, or an additional verse. He says, they shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east and shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. Here's what he said is going to happen. This is looking forward to when they're going to be in captivity and this is the northern kingdom of Israel. The Assyrians will come in. Judah is still there. They've got a couple more centuries roughly to go and carry them into captivity. Israel never comes back from that. They're never, a na- they're never a nation ever again. There's no return from captivity for Israel. They disappear within the lands occupied by Assyria. So many of them were killed anyway. The Assyrians had perfected the art of war, especially siege craft. But those that did survive in captivity, they're going to someday, sooner or later, whether it's first day in captivity or the hundredth or whatever, they're going to regret it. They're going to look back and they're going to go and they're going to try to find the Word of God, to find a prophet, to find a scroll. And there won't be a priest or a prophet or a temple or a synagogue. Synagogues weren't even really a thing yet. They're not going to find it. That's what Amos 8, 11, and 12 was about. It's actually worse when you look at the context than the other application. But it ties back to our application from Amos 4, does it? It doesn't it? It should be like a wake-up call to us tonight. To how, how valuable and precious we treat this precious, these precious words. I'm not trying to pat preachers on the back because this is far from limited to sermons or even classes. It's more than that. Anytime I have the opportunity to crack open these pages or to hear something from God's Word, I better, better value that, respect that. Because there could come a day, if I don't listen, there's the other application, when I wish I could. Maybe it might be, I, I wish I, I, could, I could just hear it one more time. The story of Jesus. Or I, I wish I had one more invitation song to stand and sing and to change my life for Jesus. When I think about these passages, we are to be the people of the book. But may we also be people who are of the book carefully and and that regardless of what text or what application, we handle the Word of God to the best of our abilities. And that we're, we're not just people who like robots can quote the Bible or make references that sound good that we take the Word of God as the Word of God and we're careful how we handle it. Because you can take anything and use it. I might come to the Bible more focused on me and what's going on in my life and I open up and I read something and I make it fit. It just might not fit. There's a call tonight. And I didn't, I did tell Gary what I was preaching on tonight. I mean, how, how do you pick songs for passages misused in Amos? But I, I am kind of glad, I guess. Now, I said I like the song. I'm kind of glad he didn't pick that song for the invitation song tonight. That might have been a little weird. But there is a call for us tonight to make sure that we are ready in the other way, to make sure that we won't someday fall to our knees, yes, in praise, but also in regret and grief. 
And that like these here, that we'd like to run back in time in this case and change something or make something right before that day arrives. If we can help you tonight, whether it is to join the kingdom of Jesus or it is to be a better servant in that kingdom, a better subject of the king of glory who treads those heights of the earth, the Lord is His name as we stand and sing together.